Well, welcome back. And uh, this next discussion is going to delve into the insecurity which is in the southeast of the country. And I'm sure all of you who've been watching this space and all other spaces in the last couple of weeks and even months uh, have been really been disturbed at how the rising case of violence in the south he southeast uh, continues to bear unfortunate outcome. I mean, you've, you've seen some of the most horrendous images you could ever imagine and things you probably just don't want to see again, banished completely from your memory, uh, whether it's with the killing of the military couple or is it with the uh, assassination of um, a member of the State Assembly of the Anambra Parliament, uh, or is it, I mean, it just goes on and on and some of this has even been documented. And you've had the bounty, 10 million naira placed on the killers on that poor gentleman from the State Assembly. But we're going to have a look at uh, some of these things this morning and try to see if we can wrap our heads around it and know that we have indeed made progress, especially for those who are watching and uh, getting to an end is what I'm sure is a desirable outcome for people who are watching the show. Professor Charles Nwekeaku is the Secretary, Igbo Elders Conservative Forum. It's a pleasure to have you join us this morning on News Hub. Thank you so much. Welcome, Joel. Excellent. And um, thank you because we are going to delve into this and I hope we can get uh, some, make some headway in the discussions this morning. So, you know, finding out what the problem is isn't the difficult part. Everyone can criticize even what the state actors have done or not done, which has made this problem um, to grow. But a lot of people oftentimes have not been able to talk about the solutions to it. And we hope during this conversation we can delve a lot into the solutions here. But first and foremost, let's get your reaction to what is going on in the Southeast with the rise in cases of violence, which is a great worry to the entire country. Yeah, well, um, what is happening in the Southeast is disheartening. It has actually taken a frightening dimension. Things that are not, the boys are not noted for, are happening. Killing, bloodletting, and all forms of violence are not part of Igbo tradition. And the uh, we fry it, it is actually worrisome that things like that are happening. And we believe that something is wrong somewhere. And so it doesn't give joy to any person, especially any person that has Igbo. And now, the Southeast is saying that it is their turn to produce the next president of Nigeria come 2023. And so, and we are getting this thing to give an impression that uh, Southeast is not stable, but it is not true. So we are not happy about it, and we condemn it in its entirety. All right, um, I, I just want to find out what you're hearing as somebody who has been involved in some security situations, especially with negotiations between the Anambra State Government and, yeah. and IPO. Um, the situation yeah. of things happening in, in the southeast is it um the category that the people who are actually committing these atrocities fall under is it that they're just frustrated with the system or they are being sponsored by some political you know um, um big wigs for vendetta uh, vendetta purposes or they're just criminally minded people how do we categorize you know because this is on an, on, on another, another level entirely thank you so much well what is happening in, in the Southeast is an extension of what is happening elsewhere in the country. And before we go into it, let me refer us to Karl Marx. Karl Marx believes that all the conflicts in the society are caused essentially by the struggle for the control of uh, material resources between the have and they have not. And if you check Nigeria, that is the problem. Every part of Nigeria today, there is instability, there is violence, because there is a struggle between those who control the resources and those who do not have the resources. And the resulting effect is violence. 
and the other things. So all these things are permutations of uh, conflict. Now, when you come to Nigeria, you see that insecurity has increased in almost every part of the country. And so why is it so? You find out that bad governance, maladministration, have been responsible because you find out that less than 5% of the population controls over 95% of the country's resources. And so many people who do not have it now think of other way of getting part of it. And that's why some people resort to all forms of violence, stealing, kidnapping, assassination, and so forth. We are not saying that these things are justified for whatever reason. Killing is not justified for whatever reason. But we must point out to the fact the major cause of these things, maladministration and bad governance. So you come to a situation, for example, Nigeria. Nigeria is an oil-producing country, sixth largest oil-producing country in the world. And in Nigeria, Nigeria has also become the poverty capital of the world. And so you have many people that are below the poverty line that they must survive. But we are not saying that what they are doing is right. But the truth is that people now take different um, means in order to survive. And that whether you talk of Boko Haram, talk of uh, uh, other uh, forms of groups struggling for power, because they believe that getting power is a sure way of controlling the resources. And that's so when you get to Southeast, for example, you see that that of Southeast is a compounded problem. You have, on the one hand, gross marginalization of the entire region by the federal government. No projects, no industries. You come to recruitment, they are discriminated against. You come to admission, they are discriminated against. You come to promotion, they are discriminated against. You come to, so you have all forms of marginalization. And people are not happy about that. Now, when you also come to Southeast itself, you will see at the state level, the governments are not doing enough. The available resources are not being equitably distributed. And so people have lost confidence in governments. And now, a number of them, though erroneously, believe that the only way out is to take up arms. It is condemnable. But this is the truth. And so because of increasing suffering, increasing poverty, unemployment, decreasing uh, depreciation of the currency, and so forth. So you keep on having social vices. So it is, it, is, it is inevitable because the environment is no longer conducive. But we are not saying that these things are justified by whatever reason. But these are the causes, bad governance, maladministration, and the inequitable distribution of resources in the society. So to some extent, most people have lost confidence right. in government. Right, right, Professor. So, so they believe that the only way right. is to take up arms. Right. It is condemnable. Right, Professor yes. Wake Akron. And, and, and I was right in the beginning. Everyone knows what the problem is. I mean, they know what the root of the problem yes. is. And great that you, in yes. your analysis, you can identify uh, the socioeconomic problems. Even the data from the Bureau of Statistics yeah. will show exactly what the yes. problems are and how it has led to um, the results we are seeing. And the great true. thing with research, yes. I, speaking with a former ambassador, um, also an Igbo elder too, some, some days ago, and you know the same sort of uh, analysis he came up with and then said, we need to point in the right direction how this will be solved, which is where yes. I think the real issue now is. So even in research, you know, you've yes. highlighted all the problems are, and from what the problems are, you can't find the solutions to each of these things. But is it as easy as that when you say, for example, um, um, unemployment, you say state capture of resources. Mm -hmm. If you as an elite and as a leader in the Igbo community, say for example, we need one thing. I don't want to be an eternal optimist to believe that a silver bullet will solve all of this yes. problem. But what is that one thing you think will make a seismic shift in how the security situation in the Southeast will improve? Yes, uh, the security situation in the Southeast could be addressed 
through a multilateral approach. Number one is good governance. If you have good governance, that will guarantee equitable distribution of resources. That will guarantee accountability. That will guarantee transparency. And that will help people to begin to have faith in government again. That is one. Two, there's need to have consultation. Consult all the stakeholders, give them a sense of belonging, discuss with them, find out their views, make them to be part of the uh, conflict, uh, conflict resolution process. Number three, dialogue. Dialogue with people. There is no place kinetic measures e essentially can provide solution to violence. You, yeah, where sometimes you may adopt uh, kinetic measures, but essentially go for non-kinetic measures. Dialogue with people. Find out what the problems are. So in this case, give them a sense of belonging. Let them be part of a conflict resolution process, and then you get results. So in the case of the South is today, because you remember before the Anambara state election, there was a story everywhere that APOB and other uh, youth, or, uh, youth organizations threatened that there will be no election. Well, some of us will reach out to them, dialogue with them, explain to them why that election should hold. And after explaining, less than 24 hours, they come up publicly and say, look, people, feel free to go for election. Because first they were consulted, second they were respected, thought they were given a sense of uh, belonging. And, and that, was, that was why the election could take place. So if you want to address the issue in the Southeast, first is that the state governors must come down to the level of these people, invite them, discuss with them, not coming out on the television and making threatening statements. No, it doesn't help any person invite them, invite the community leaders, traditional rulers, the clergy. Then invite these youth, various youth organizations, it's not just IPOB, there are others, invite all of them, sit down with them, let them know the implications of some of the activities, and then allow them even to come up with solution. And then some of them, yeah. I'm going to say this aspect, you find out that some of these youths who are in different organizations today, because of the militarization of the Southeast, a number of them have gone into the bush. Uh, that means they've left their shops, they've left their sources of income, they've gone into the bush, and some of them are armed. And an angry man being armed is dangerous to the society. You see an angry man having weapons, and the person is hungry, and then what else? So the next thing is that any available uh, means, that person could go into kidnapping, that person could go into shackling, that person could go into assassination, that person can take over the, because the person is hungry and the person is armed. And so I think what we should begin to do, starting from our governors, is to begin at each state level, invite the stakeholders to meeting. Don't discriminate. Get our top people. Get uh, mass up. Get the others. Invite them to a, a, a roundtable discussion. Discuss with them. See their views. And then don't threaten any person. Then even if there is a need to rehabilitate some people, go ahead and rehabilitate them. And you see that they will drop their arms and embrace peace. But if you keep on talking from... Uh, that is um, talking to them anyhow, they may not obey. You remember the time uh, governors, many governors, especially the issue of seats at home, governors gave directive that you should come to a stop. Who obeyed them? And so I believe and I'm appealing to our governors to rise up to the occasion. Invite all the stakeholders in the Southeast to a round table meeting. 
And before then, you can set up committees. The committee will now help you people to organize, reach out to relevant stakeholders, bring them to a roundtable discussion, and then you see that there will be peace in, in the Southeast. But so, if we keep on talking anyhow from isolated places, it may not lead us anywhere. But good governance above all is very, very imperative. Absolutely. Let there be good governance. Absolutely, Dr. Mwekaku, thank Let you so much. Let there be good governance, because a situation where a majority of the populace are uh, well, uh, well open in poverty and few people are uh, swimming in affluence, it creates problem. And that is why you are now having kidnapping and so forth. All right, and Doctor. So let good governor begin. Dr. Wekaku, thank you so much uh, for you know your recommendations you. there. I mean, these yeah. recommendations you made actually not far fetched, right? It's not something very difficult to do. Dialogue, stakeholder collaboration, and good governance. Yeah, um, uh, but yeah. I wonder why it's it's been lingering. Uh, you know, despite this is not the first time people have been making such recommendations anyway. And it, it makes, it makes, yes, it makes yes. people wonder why the, the, the situation is lingering and then wasn't. Does this make true the school of yes. thought that suggests that the Southeastern governors, the leaders of the South, is actually politicizing the security situation? Mm. Yes. Um, apart from that, people have lost confidence in the governors. And so, even if they extend the invitation to people now, some of these stakeholders may not honor that. That's why I suggested that they should set up committees of credible people. There are people that you see in a committee. These people, these boys will come out. Apple people will come. Myself will come. If they invite them directly, they may not come. Set up committees comprising credible and respectful members of the society, and then let them provide the platform for this meeting, and it will work. So, yes, I agree with you that issue of politicization is there. Uh, some people, you see, for example, there was a time that these governors came up and said that they had established a, a bubago. In establishing that a bubago, they didn't do much consultation. In establishing the Abubago, they invited foreigners who are not Igbos. And so people from the beginning do, do not have that confidence in the Abubago. And the other, that is, the other processes were not observed. And so we are saying, yes, it's part of the politicization. We are appealing to the governors to calm down. Look out for some, in every state in Igbo land, there are people who still enjoy a modicum of credibility. Get these people. Let them help to organize this meeting with the youths, with other stakeholders, and we shall get solution. So you find out that everything is political. When they want to do it, it is taking political strength. Look for people who are not in government. Upon some of them, give them the responsibility to reach out to the youth, to reach out to the uh, traditional rulers, reach out to all the stakeholders, and then let's discuss this issue. And you'll find out that you have solution. So, but if you keep on talking from government uh, houses, talking anyhow, people will not respond. And so I agree with you that there is a politicization, but uh, also people are angry <clears throat> because people do no longer see the reason for the existence of government. Government is there primarily for the protection of lives and property, as well as provision of uh, social services for the people. But today, government is no longer doing these things. So people have lost confidence. And so the starting point is to begin to rebuild people's confidence in governance by doing the right thing, by making sure that government is accountable, by making sure that government is transparent, by making sure that there's democracy, just like now, yes, we are talking of uh, election next year. You can see that as it stands now, only most people who are in government were able to afford the high cost of nomination forms. A number of people who could have made a difference have been eliminated through high cost uh, 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 APC collecting uh, or collecting 100 million for presidential. 
uh, PDP for 12 million. How many honest Nigerians can afford it? So you see that indirectly, a number of people have been excluded from governance and people are not happy. So eventually, even when you elect these people, many people will not have to, confidence in them. So they will see them as just like a Michel Ayon law of oligarchy. The tendency of people in government to use the machinery to perpetuate themselves in government. When they are old, they put their children. And when their children are not available, they put leakers who will go there and continue to do their bidding. So good governance will continue to do the society. Right, so professor. long as the process of getting leadership is not sanitized. And so right, right, that professor, is the beginning yeah. point. Right. Right. Very, yes. very, very well that said. That is the beginning. The beginning point. Absolutely. Yes. And I'm sure a lot of people can call. Yes. With, with the you. beginning is, uh, is to make the process of election to be uh, to be sanitized, sanitize it, let so me, that as many people as possible can participate. So let that me backtrack you. you are elected Great. And those who enjoy the trust of this society. Great. Let, let me take you back on some, on some of the proposals you made. Uh, a lot, a lot of a lot of them yes. has to do have to do with uh, economic as well as uh, developmental because it's at the crux of this yes. where you have yes. uh, people who don't have jobs and have now become fodder uh, to feel the crisis yes. going on. You know that uh, mm. when you have a situation in crisis, for people to come and invest, whether local or foreign investors, is almost a, a no-go area. And you talk about the yes. rebuilding process that must happen, especially with the economies of the major cities in the southeast. I was talking with someone some time back uh, in Medu uh, uh, about Bonus State Medugri. So despite the great work Professor Zulum is doing, because of the crisis that's happened over there for several years, they've been without electricity for, over, for nearly two years now. And you need electricity to power the economy. We don't want the Southeast yes. to get to that situation where we are now measuring gains in piecemeal. What will you say in terms of how the private sector can come in to help rebuild? I know many of them don't want to talk about investment being lost there in the Southeast because of the sit-at-home order, but you're going to need yes. everyone on deck, according to what you say, to help in the rebuilding process. Yes. So far, I haven't had anything yes. from uh, the private sector has been more of what the government can do. What can the private people do to help at least restart uh, the economies in the southeast? Yes, well, <clears throat> you found out that Igbos generally, they depend on small and medium enterprises. An average Igbo man is a trader. And so you find out that for you to trade, for you to set up a small business, there should be security in the society. And so today there's no security. There should be power supply. So you go to the Southeast, you don't have access roads. You don't have power supply. There is insecurity. So what are you going to invest? So you find out that without good uh, in, uh, environment, a conducive environment, investment is difficult. So in the Southeast today, you have bad roads two there's no power three don't have other um, federal government presence that also help to generate employment opportunities so essentially people who are supposed to do this thing they ha don't have the enablement to do that so if you they should come in but they can only come in and invest when the society is secured when the environment is secured so on at this time today, how many people will bring their money and invest in an environment that is not secured? Even going to work, you are not sure if you leave your house that you get to your office. You are not sure that if you leave your office, you get home because of increasing in security. So there is a need to have security in the Southeast for investment to take place. There is also a need to have power supply so that the cost of production will be less. So today, investment in the Southeast is very high. And that's why many people are running out to invest elsewhere. But we are appealing to them that there's no place as good as home. East or West, home is the best. We must make Southeast conducive for all of us 
so that the small and medium enterprises can begin to thrive again. So even the federal government has adopted SME as engine of development, that for some East, that was just a, a confirmation of the obvious fact because we depend on small and medium enterprises. But because of bad governance today, because of insecurity, because of lack of power and other things, even uh, financing is difficult. It is becoming uh, difficult for people to invest. So today, you find out that a woman that um, sells akara, or a woman that you know roasts yam and plantain, is no longer sure of her security. So where will she begin? And even when you talk of sit at home, remember when you sit at home, your stomach doesn't know that you're sitting at home. Your children do not know that you're sitting at home. They will eat. And that's why Kamas considers economic activity as the most important activity in this society, because it has to do with the production of food, without which no person will survive. So we want a conducive investment climate in the Southeast for small and medium enterprises to begin to operate again. We want security. We want power. We want good road network. So if we do this, you don't need to ask an Igbo man to begin to invest. So trading is part of us. An average Igbo man is into trading, but there should be a conducive environment for oh. that to take place. All right, um, Dr. Mikaku, thank you so much for that. Let's, let's just stay a bit on the uh, kinetic versus, you know, um, the dialogue uh, recommendations. Um, not so long ago, specifically, I think between 2020, 2020 and 2021, a lot of Easterners, South Easterners, you know, were screaming, military operations, no, we don't want that. Um, even when opera uh, operations like... Uh, or Python dance and Golden Dawn uh, was put in place to help curb the insecurity issues around, um, you know, specific states in, in the region. Yes. Would you say with the benefit of hindsight that probably should have continued? Did it help in any way or did it make matters worse? Well, the militarization made matters worse because the militarization actually made people to lose faith in government. So they decided to take arms in order to defend themselves. They take up arms in order to defend themselves. So the militarization of the Southeast was a major cause of the situation we are passing through today. So you don't solve a societal problem with militarization. And so when the military came like that, the target essentially were the youths. And so many youths lost their lives Till today, we have many Igbo youths languishing in different detention camps in different parts of the country, and that is not good enough. We are talking; you are talking of a, a, a um, economy where you, youth form larger percentage of the labor force of every uh, country or state. So, with most of our men youths driven into the forest, who will now do the economic activity, and so. The militarization actually aggravated the situation we're having today. But that is not to justify what is happening in the Southeast today. So that militarization of the Southeast is not good. And so we condemned it, but we are also saying now, we must not continue to blame uh, any person for that. We have to, our people, our youths, our stakeholders, must know that our people are suffering. The need to drop the arms has come. We should drop our arms and embrace dialogue. We should look for solution. We must come together and discuss and then ensure that we give every person a sense of belonging. When you give people a sense of belonging, they will support the government. And if people support the government, now you see that there's no limit to what the government will achieve. So today, Government and the people are isolated, and that is the major problem. People do not have confidence in those in authority, and that's why the non-state actors have taken over, because they see them as a new source of power, as a new source of uh, encouragement, and that shouldn't be. And so we are saying that 
militarization is not an option. And the only person thinking of, of it is not helping the matter. We don't want that. What we should do is dialogue. Let's dialogue with all the stakeholders. Let's consult and then let's find solution for insecurity and increasing violence in the Southeast. If we do that, you find out that businesses will pick up because so long as people are not sure of their security, many people will not invest. We have many people that are in diaspora. They can't come back and invest because security is not guaranteed. Their security is not guaranteed. And so I believe that if the government will change its approach, then peace will return to Southeast. Government should change its approach. Forget about high-handedness. Forget about threats. Forget about militarization. Embrace the people. Call them. Dialogue with them. And then rehabilitate some of them. Because another problem we are having now is that most of these youth who have been driven into the forest for many months and some years have lost their businesses. So remember they have family, they have wife, they have children. And today, some of them, their children are no longer in schools. Their children have been set out of schools. So how do they uh, adjust in the society? So there's also a need for rehabilitation of some of them. Government can do this with whatever little resources we have. Let's call our stakeholders, then dialogue with them, rehabilitate the ones we can rehabilitate, and then there will be peace in our, uh, our uh, uh, land. And it will be okay for every person. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Rick Akron, and, and, and brilliant um, conversation yes. we're having with you uh, so far. Uh, so help, help us also, you know, because I, I understand you've got a rich background. I mean, I'm just looking through uh, some of the stuff you've done, and I mean, really impressive, especially in the media, interestingly, as a, as a senior editor and a publisher. But help, help us um, look at what the media also, too, has done in, in its role, because they're also vital partners in how uh, this whole story is unfolding, especially in the Southeast, and how it's been covered. Uh, in your view, what you think it's done right, or, and what you think it's not done right and has to improve on uh, in how the stories are being presented to the people. Well, I want to commend the media for the wonderful job they have been doing. But uh, there are some areas they need adjustment. If not for the media, many people wouldn't know what are happening in different parts of the country including the Southeast, is the media. But sometimes the media reports are sensational. And that should not be it. I read journalism, I practiced it, and we were taught that in reporting, you give, uh, your reporting should be objective. And how do you ensure objectivity? By giving a balanced report. Talk to Mr. B, talk to Mr. A. So don't publish your story from just one source. You see, for example, you see, like in, in the Southeast, there are many reports of killings. But the world of yesterday, I think Delhi Trust, if I remember, it pointed out that people who were killed were not us. And you can see from today, you'll be getting different responses from that thing. Now, there are other killings. We regret that killing. We condemn that killing. But you also see that a day before that thing, a young legislator was killed. It was not stated Sultana. And now today, there are many people who were killed in Bono, in Yobe. No people, media didn't go to say the state of origin of those people who were killed. So the moment you come say Sultana, or Westerner, you are sensationalizing that report. So I want to appeal to the media. They should be very sensitive. Today, Nigeria is on a precipice. If media do not take care, they are doing a wonderful job, I agree. But there is a need to be careful in reporting. 
you must be careful how you choose your words. That adjective that was added in that report was not good enough. You could have said a woman and four children killed. Yes, we condemn it. But now uh, saying identify not an answer. You see, these people who are killing, they don't ask you where you come from. The young legislator that was killed, no person asked him. It's just that they caught him, unfortunately, killed him, beheaded him. Other people did something. The other time, Dr. Akunye was killed, and so forth. So the media should be careful in reporting so that they do not sensationalize certain things to avoid instigating different sections of the country. Why we, I extend my condolences. Igbo Elders Consultative Forum has already extended con, uh, condolences, condemned the killing. But we want to appeal to the media to be careful in the choice of their words. They are working. There's no doubt about that. But they should try as much as possible to be objective, to make sure that they give a balanced report. When you give your balanced report, look, no person will have any problem with you. So we want to thank the media, but let them try as much as possible to avoid sensation so that you don't set Nigeria on a civil war again. We don't want that. We don't want that. Uh, uh, all right, Dr. Mekako, thank you so much. Um, yes. the, the Igbo Consultative, um, Elders Consultative Forum, um, among other groups in the Southeast, um, mm -hmm. are really clamoring yes. for you know, uh, the Southeastern you know, Presidency come 2023. Um, I, I, yes. I, and, we, and we're wondering how that's going to happen when we have some people still in the Southeast that are you know, conversing campaigning for people from other, you know, from other regions. I mean, there's a lot of wonder around um, if the Igbos have one voice in the first place to push home and be able to get this demand. Your thoughts, please. Well, um, I think even some of the killings, because we also set up committees to investigate. Most of them were not traceable to the Igbos. And that's why you now have a conspiracy theory that those who do not want that is to produce the next president come 2023 are part of the problems we're having in the Southeast. Now, just to give the impression that these people could not be trusted. Now, let me start. In 1999, when Nigerians compensated the Southwest, for the annulment of uh, June 12, 1993 election, the leader had been won by Chief Emiko Abiola. You remember that in 1999, the Sato was compensated by ensuring that major political parties zone the presidency to the Southwest. And that was why Chief Olu Shegun of Basanjo and Chief Olu Fale um, were the candidates. Before then, you know that an illustrious Igbo son, Dr. Alessi, who was my former vice president, organized Group 34 that actually metamorphosed into PDP. Other than being equal, he was set to pick the ticket. Equally, uh, Dr. Boniono organized ANPP then. He actually picked the ticket. But when the issue of compensation came, both of them stepped down and Southwest was compensated. So they were not in agreement. As a matter of fact, they voted for Alliance for Democracy, that Nigerians voted for uh, Chief Lushe of Basanjo. Today, instead of Nigerians coming to talk with one voice, they are looking for just to give a dog a bad name just to hang it. They are telling you that the South they are not speaking with one voice. Tell me any session that has spoken with one voice before. So at every point in time, the Igbos, we agree, are Republican in nature. But equally, the Igbos can also come to a consensus when the, it matters most. So in this time, the Igbos have been consistent. The Ohaneze, the Igbo Elder Consensus Forum, the Igbo Ohaneze Youth, and so forth, we have been saying it is the turn of the Southeast. Apart from the Igbos, Afeni Ferre leadership to to has also said it is turn. The Pandef, Southern and Middle Belt Forum, right. many Nigerians have been saying it is the turn of the Southeast. But the few Nigerians 
who do not wish the South East were are creating problems there, saying that we are not speaking with one voice. Oh. Tell me at every point in time, any other session of the country spoke with one voice on issue of leadership. Right. But even this one, this one is unprecedented. For the first time, the Yorubas are saying, give it to the South East. You, uh, Chief Ayad Ebanja, the leader of our periphery, has several times said it. Mm. Uh, Chief Edwin Clark, the leader of Pandev, has several times said it. Dr. Butchus Spogu, the leader of Middle Bear, has several times said it. And many other people, even Northerners, have said it zenly to the Southeast for right. the sake of uh, justice, Professor Wiki, peace, could, thank you. and equity. But people who want to foment trouble right. are telling you that South East are not united. They are killers in the South East. How many people are killed in the South East? Right. Today, see what is happening in Bruno. It's a rolling, see what is happening in Yobe. It's see a what is happening in the North West. More people are killed right. in the Professor Wake Akko, it's a, it's a rolling conversation, and thank you very much for your resourcefulness, uh, brilliant analysis, uh, very spot on. We are going to have to leave it at that. Professor Charles Wake Akko, Secretary, Igbo Elders Conservative Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Excellent. We'll touch bases with you again because one of the bright voices we need to hear again and again on the issues uh, with respect to Saudi's development and uh, security and all of that. We're going to go on a quick break. When we come back, we we'll cross over to Ukraine and find out if there's been any change uh, in affairs with what has been going on so far. Please stay with us on News Hub. <laughs>